anytime you do something that makes your brain or your body evolve, it will involve discomfort. Mm -hmm. But suffering comes when you resist the discomfort. When I test my brain on the neuroscience stuff from my neuroscience company, I have the response time in my brain of a 20 year old and it linearly goes up with age and part of superhuman, the anti-aging thing. No, I've got the data. It shows I have a 20 year old's brain and it's awesome because I can keep up. Otherwise I wouldn't. That's incredible. I can't wait to test that out. I'd love to see how old my brain is. That'd be pretty, whose brain has fascinated you the most that oh. you've tested? Whose brain yeah. is... Well, I mean, a lot of times I there's confidentiality. This is yeah. 40 years of Zen. It doesn't have to tell me okay. who it is. Got it. Yeah, don't so, tell me who it is. Okay, so, yeah. so this is a, a Neuroscience Institute five-day intensive program in Seattle, custom hardware software, all, all this clinical grade stuff to see what's going on in there and then to performance tune it like a, a race car for your brain. And I mean, we've had some of the spiritual leaders from South America come through. Um, one of the guys really fascinating, actually he's public about this, uh, Dr. Barry Morgulon. Mm -hmm. He's one of 12 living grandmasters of Lao Tzu's oral heritage. Wow. And uh, he's spoken at the Bulletproof Conference and uh, just a good friend, been on the show a couple of times. So this guy is Dr. Strange, literally. He went to the, the monastery. They interviewed him before they wrote Dr. Strange. And he, he just has these abilities. He works with Tony Robbins and works with me before I, I go on stage and things like that. And some you know, presidents of countries kind of guy. So you look at his brainwaves and you're like, this is not a normal human being. And some guys like him... If he turns it up all the way, he'll fuzz out the gear. Literally, you're looking at brainwaves and all that stuff, and all of a sudden you can't get a clean signal. Yeah. And this is something intrinsic in our biology. You talk about real superhumans. You look at the people who are way outliers. Those are where the most interesting thing happens because how do we take you and me and how do we turn up our abilities to do that? Because we all have that in us. And that was one of the reasons I wanted to write this book. It might take a few decades, so you're going to need more decades or you might cheat. That's you know, what I'm doing on the neuroscience front. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, no, I, I'm excited to share because uh, when my books come out, I've got a ton of research on the minds of monks. I yeah. know we have a lot yeah. of similarities there and I'm fascinated by how monks meditations can switch, uh, like you're saying, on and off like a switch, you know, just from compassion to empathy to, yeah. to focus to discipline without even a second of warm up. And we've been studying this for 30, 40 years, but traditional neuroscience is all about seizures and surgery and, and things like that. But now in the neurofeedback category, we know what's a carrier wave. We know what's happening down in Delta. We know what's happening in Alpha in a meditator versus a monk. And the reason that my program is 40 years of Zen is it's meant to replace 40 years of daily practice of meditation because hurry, meditate faster. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> That's incredible. And, and have you, how, how have you seen the results compare? Uh, it, it's ridiculous. What you end up with, if you were to spend all that time studying, and I've been to Tibet to learn meditation from the masters. In fact, I, I first had yak butter tea, which was the inspiration for Bulletproof Coffee in Tibet when I was there to learn meditation. And I was like, wait, what? this stuff is more powerful. Something just happened with this weird mixing tea or mixing butter and things. But you look at what happens there is, well, you learn, you know, there's seven layers of hell and all this wisdom. And depending on whether you're looking at a Hindu perspective or a Buddhist perspective, or, you know, there's other traditional Chinese things, or there's European. So there's all these lineages and heritage and shamanic training and all these things. And, and I've, I've had a chance to, to learn some of those, but there's wisdom and then there's the felt state. Mm -hmm. And what you can do is you can achieve the felt state using the tools of breathing, tools of meditation, tools of neurofeedback. And you can be there, but without at least some guidance, <laughs> you might not know where you are. You just yeah. know it feels really different and you can kind of blow your mind open. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and I've, I've noticed that I think for a lot of people who come from non-spiritual traditions or yeah. backgrounds, a lot of this is great at also just giving them a window into the fact that this exists yeah. and is possible. And I think the felt state is a much more tangible experience for them mm -hmm. to believe that it's not just some elusive thing, but it's it's real. Yeah. I didn't yeah. believe any of this. I'm a computer science, computer hacker, weighed 300 pounds, come up from a family of engineers. And anyone who believe this is clearly stupid. That's how I was raised. Yeah. And when you feel something, you're like, whoa, what's, there's a signal in here that might be useful. And you realize it's actually not just useful, it's hackable. And you can choose the felt state and you can use that to sense the world around you and to connect with people and things. 
it was a pretty big awakening for me, but it, it's part of the path. And what I discovered, and the reason I went down the bulletproof path at the same time doing the 40 years of Zen, if you want to do personal development, you want to meditate, you want to improve your brain, doing it on French fries doesn't, it doesn't work. You have to get your biology in order because if your cells don't make energy, it's subcellular components that drive most of your felt state. And if they're running at half power, how are you going to have enough energy to you know, wake up, you know, have whatever you have in the morning, uh, take care of, of yourself, take care of your family, your community. Oh, and had time and energy left over to do the deep personal work to you know, let go of a childhood thing or, uh, you know, reach a new state of performance. No, you were too tired because your cells didn't work. So eat right and then do the meditative practice and you'll get more results in less time. And you went through that experience too, right? Cause you were 22, 300 pounds. I was 300 pounds. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Tell, tell us about that journey just before we dive into all of this incredible insight. Tell us about that journey and transition of when you came to the point where you were like, there is more out there, but even before that, this, what I'm doing to my biology isn't good for me. Well, it, it's really weird. Anyone who's fat will will tell you at some level they know they're fat because we have a mirror. You don't need a scale. My pants keep getting tight. What, what do I do here? And then you say, well, I'm going to try to do something. And trying to do something is already presupposing failure. It's, I call it a weasel word in, in my books. Mm -hmm. And what you end up with is you say, all right, I'm going to do what's supposed to work. And anyone who's ever read anything says, oh, we must be meat robots. Therefore, it's calories in, calories out. So I did that. I worked out for an hour and a half a day, six days a week for 18 months. Was that hard at that time? Of course time? it was yeah. hard. And it, although exercise is addictive when you do it like that, you get the endorphins, you get a, a rush from it. So it's hard to stop exercising. And you, there, I know people who are addicted. Like, I, I, I can't do anything today. I got to go exercise. That's not a healthy state. Yeah. Right? That means you're, you're stuck with the endorphins, the runner's high or whatever. And for me, I went on a low fat, low calorie diet. And at the end of this, I still weighed 300 pounds. I, I could max out the machines. It wasn't 300 pounds of muscle. I was covered in flab. I still was a 46 inch waist. I'm a 33 inch waist right now. And I, I just, I looked around and said, maybe it's because I'm eating too much lettuce. That, that was my math. Right? <laughs> it's because I'm not trying Nothing hard enough. Else. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and seriously, all my friends are eating double Western bacon cheeseburgers mm -hmm. and I'm eating the salad with no chicken and no dressing. And I'm hungry, just so hungry. And I'm just putting all my willpower into this. And I don't care if I'm sick. I don't care if I have final exams. I'm going to go to the gym. Mm. And it, just the sense of failure, but it became a, a self-worth problem. And then I said... One day, I'm actually doing all this and I'm not getting the results. It must be what I'm doing doesn't work. And then you start digging in the research and I started trying all the different variations on diets and went really deep on the corners of the internet. And this is back in the late 90s. People didn't even use the internet for this kind of stuff, but I'd find weird researchers and I would just test it all because I was computer science. I'm building the internet as we know it. I'm pretty sure that I'd be able to just hack this dumb meat body. <laughs> um, and the idea of hacking is that you can take control of a system, you can manipulate it without understanding what's inside. You test inputs and outputs. So, all right, that actually works really well in biology, but it's not what medicine does. It's a different thing. It's what bodybuilders do. It's what the anti-aging community does. It's what Navy SEALs do. And heck, it's what people who own racehorses do to their racehorses. So how do we apply that to ourselves? And I said, all right, I'm going to get over this childhood. I've had arthritis in my knees since I was 14. And it, I found out later when I reverse engineered it all, I lived in a house that had toxic mold and I poisoned the mitochondria in my body. So I repaired that damage. And I said, wait, there's, there's always new levels, uh, things I can do where I didn't think I'd, I'd look the way I look. I'd feel the way I feel. I'd be able to do what I do. And I can, and I'm continuously getting powerful and younger and faster. My brain works better. Uh, I just mentioned about ping pong. To see the actual data and to see the scan, oh, I have 87th percentile hippocampal volume, the hippocampus in the brain. Look, I started out fat and sick. If I can do this, I'm pretty sure that someone who started out reasonably healthy with a normal body weight and normal biology has huge advantages. But everyone listening to this right now, you're thinking, okay, how, how I feel now, how I've always felt, that's pretty much normal, but you're totally wrong. That's just what you've experienced. But if you could feel five times better and 10 times more energy, 
you would never know because you never felt it. 100%. So our job is to just teach people, here's the tools to tap into it in the least possible amount of time and money mm-hmm. because it's there. And it feels like that's the energy, that experimentation at that stage has led to now this decision or aspiration to live to one eight, 180 years old. Like why, why, why 180 specifically? Because I'm sure mm-hmm. there's some math behind that, I'm, I'm sure. assuming. And, and why, why want to live longer anyway? Right. For you. No, it's at least 180. I don't want to put a cap on it. Okay. So important nice. difference there. Great. Okay. <laughs> now, the math is really straightforward. We know we can do 120 because we've seen it. Mm. And those people, they drank, they smoked, they went through, let's see, what was happening 120 years ago? It was 1900. Mm-hmm. There's no cars. They haven't been invented yet. <laughs> There's no microwaves. World War One, World War Two haven't happened. Antibiotics haven't been discovered. DNA, they couldn't even spell it back then. Yeah, <laughs> true, true. <laughs> the Krebs cycle for America. We didn't know much at all mm. about how our bodies work. And they still lived 120. Yeah. Okay. But they weren't exposed to as much trauma as we are. Oh, they no, they had more to- trauma than we did. Mm exposure they had more trauma literally in the world yeah but not necessarily exposure on a daily basis do you know the odds of having one of your siblings die 120 years ago the reason you had five or six kids is because a couple of them weren't going to make it Mm -hmm. okay like a Mm -hmm. redundant array of inexpensive kids Mm -hmm. they invented it back then in fact we invented that in society back then Mm -hmm. so people grew up with their family members dying you didn't know if anyone would come home. You couldn't call them on their cell phone. Someone gets on a boat, they don't come back. You don't, maybe you'll get a letter three months later. People disappeared all the time. It was a pretty shitty time. Oh, mm-hmm. we didn't even talk about polio. We didn't talk about all the diseases that just wipe people out that generally don't get us anymore. You go to the doctor, they're going to cut your arm off with a rusty saw. Mm-hmm. Back back. They're like, this is the state yeah. of people who lived 120 now. Now, I'm just going to have to say it. How old are you? I'm 32. 32. All right. So let's think what it's going to be like 120 years from now, given that we can rely on the internet, we can look at PubMed. I couldn't write these books. Each of the books, the superhuman book would have been a lifetime of research in a library using microfiche and card catalogs and all this crap. But the fact that I can pull together this information and I have the weird brain that synthesizes it and I can talk to these experts, all of this is enabled by technology in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we can't add 50% to the maximum human lifespan over the next 150 for you, 148 years? <laughs> like put on your future hat and realize exponential rates of growth. You have a very good chance of living way, way, way beyond 180. If there's still soil on the planet, uh, if a comet doesn't hit us, right? And if essentially we take care of the world enough. Mm-hmm. So that, that that's the big one. That's the Taking big one. Taking care of the world enough. But here's the other reason that we need more highly energetic old people. Mm -hmm. In all societies that I studied, and it's in like the first chapter of Superhuman, I I talk about the quest for immortality is uh, something that's happened as long as we've had recorded history, going back to the Egyptians, going back to the alchemists, going back to the Hindu traditions, the Chinese traditions, the South American traditions. They've all been searching for this. Mm -hmm. And things like Taoism are tied directly towards that quest for how do I live forever as a highly functioning, highly energetic, evolved person. Well, we've always had village elders. So what would happen is the young monks would go into the monastery and the 80 year old Lama would look at them and say, all right, here's what we've learned. And I learned this from my elders and I learned it from my elders. In fact, Lao Tzu's tradition, 5,000 years of unbroken oral history passed Mm -hmm. down from the elders. Mm -hmm. Well, elders today, unfortunately, a lot of them, Alzheimer's disease, heart attacks, retirement homes. And we started seeing our elders rather than as sources of knowledge and wisdom, the people who can guide us the best. We started seeing them as tubes, monitors, diapers, wheelchairs, and expenses. Mm -hmm. And that's actually never happened. Great observation, yeah. All of history hasn't happened. Great observation. So I go out of my way to interview people who are over 90 Mm. because, man, they've got 50 years on me. Mm. And what did they learn that I'm probably going to learn? And what can they, what pain can I avoid from listening to them? Yeah. Would I like them to be 120 and still have fully functioning, vibrant lives so I could learn even more and they could share it? Heck yeah. Well, the world needs that. Plus, Jay, if you're going to live for hundreds of years more, you aren't going to throw the plastic bottle in the ocean. 
you realize, oh my God, I better not shit in my own sandbox mm -hmm. because I'm going to be in the sandbox for a very long time. I'm not going to hand it off to the next generation the way currently the boomers are getting blamed. And it's funny because the boomers are saying, well, wait, we inherited World War One and World War II from you old people, but they're all dead, so we can't yeah, blame yeah. you anymore. We just keep going back and back and yeah, back. Yeah. And they're saying, we inherited this from you know the Civil War. It, it just, it, it, goes, it goes back forever. We always inherit this, but the scope of inheritance is going to change. And, and Anyone who has kids is unlikely to say, you know, I'd like to have kids three times throughout my 200 years. They're, you're going to have kids. You're going to put so much energy and life into them the way all parents do, right? You're going to enjoy seeing them flourish, but we're not going to worry about an overpopulation problem. And the data supports what I'm saying very, very clearly. Mm. Japan, U.S., most Western countries, the birth rate's gone down. Populations are declining. And so is the fertility rate. So we don't have to worry about global population. Just wait 50 years. It won't be a problem. I'm intrigued. I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated. The reason is because it's we're talking about also, and I, I want to get your thoughts on this because I think we were we were talking about different things there. You're talking about obviously the the physical abilities mm -hmm. have increased, but with the rise of mental health, yeah, even even if it is with less trauma, the way we're able to process traumatic events or tragedy tragedies or challenges seems to be struggling. It's funny. There's I'm just intrigued. I'm just, yeah. I'm just throwing it out there. I want to get your about perspective. I'm, I'm not negative at all. I'm just it, trying to. It doesn't sound negative. You ever? There's a documentary uh, that come out that came out recently. It's called "They Shall Not Grow Old." Oh, I've not seen it. Oh. It's about World War One. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, the toughness, the resilience of was... of these guys. <laughs> It's unimaginable. And they interview people who are still alive from World War I, but they show footage and they, they tell these stories and, and you're saying no human walking the face of the earth today could do what these guys did. Exactly. So isn't that a challenge in lasting longer? Because if the resilience and grit was so much more higher then that people could lose their family member, their family member never came back from the boat, but they never, did they have the mental health challenge? They never talked about it. They, ne they couldn't share it on social media. Like, or did they just not, did they just not feel it? Whereas today we're, Oh, really sensitive they, and everything. They felt it, but how you felt just didn't matter as much. It was how you showed up in the world. Right. So they, they would cram it down. I don't know how happy they were. There's war veterans. People knew that people came back from war changed. Yeah. But there's also, there was a community and there's something else that happened. Most of the time, if you took a big hit to the head, you just died. Mm -hmm. So now we have a lot more traumatic brain injury and people who survive horrific injuries mm -hmm. who come back with more trauma. Mm -hmm. But our technologies for dealing with trauma, even some of the neuroscience stuff, the, the things that are a big focus for me at 40 Years of Zen, and you, you deal with nutritionally, you put them in a hyperbaric chamber, you can heal almost any emotional trauma and so many physical traumas. The problem is when a physical trauma ties to an emotional trauma, it doesn't work. You can also precondition people. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of times people just don't know about the research. Mm -hmm. Something called heart rate variability. It's a, a core part of what, what I teach people. This is how to change the spacing between your heartbeats. When you're relaxed in a meditative state, you have a higher change in the spacing between your heartbeats. Same number of beats per minute, but the mm -hmm. pattern of the beats changes. Mm -hmm. Well, if you teach soldiers to do this before they go into combat or kids before they get bullied, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> yeah. it, your body thinks it's the same thing. You actually don't walk away from that with PTSD. Yes. You can precondition for it. So what we could do is we can teach resilience. 100%. And I wasn't necessarily highly resilient, but I am now. Mm. And this is just missing from our curriculum. Correct. It is a neuroscience state. It's it's you can define it, you can measure it, you can quantify it, and then you can put a moral judgment on it. Yes. There there shouldn't be a moral judgment. Yeah. I yeah. No, no. You used to be able to, you know, you'd go to church and, you know, you've been bad, right? <laughs> or what, whatever the, the pattern of, of your church was. But people now are abandoning religion. Religion provided some of that, the, the prayer before your meal. You don't have to pray to a specific deity that someone told you had to, but you can provide a sense of gratitude, mm -hmm. which is the real nugget there. Mm -hmm. Without gratitude, you can't do forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Without gratitude, you stay in fight or flight. So you can program these things in, but what does gratitude actually look like in the brain and in the heart? You can measure those and you can look. I can sit here across from you if you're wired up and I can say, you're actually not feeling grateful. You said you were grateful and you lied to yourself and hold you accountable to that. That is That's amazing, insane. Yeah, right? I love that too. Yeah, yeah, I love that too. And I, and I hope that one day we can all have that next to us so we know we're not lying to ourselves. 
I'm, because it's fun being a lie detector for other people, but yeah. it's better being a lie detector for ourselves. And that's why we have coaches. That's why we have gurus. Yeah. That's why we have friends. Yes. The problem is that you're very likely to get angry at a friend or a coach when they really call you out on your BS. Can't get angry at your phone. Yeah. <laughs> how, how right. Click yeah, like, like the data is the data. Yeah. And that's what I do. It's one of the most important, impactful things in my life has yeah. been the 40 years of Zen training. Yes. Where when I do that. Uh, if there's something that I'm hiding from myself, I'm not going to know it. I'm going to look you in the eye. I'm going to deny it. And you're going to do the same thing to me because yeah. our ability to look inside ourselves is very low. But when you have a, a mirror right here, you, oh, I have spinach in my teeth. Yeah. But you're not going to know you have spinach in your no. teeth. And until your friend's scared shows. to tell you unless yeah. they're really close to you. Yeah, exactly. What, what I love about you, though, when I'm hearing you speak and, and I've never, I guess, I guess you don't, when you meet someone, you, you, you unearth things differently. And it's like, you really have this great juxtaposition between wisdom and science, which I think is so powerful and beautiful. And you started off there. And I think when it's either or, it can get slightly lost sometimes. They have to align. Yeah. And one of the reasons I, I created this field of biohacking, mm. and it's now a word in the dictionary, yeah. in I think 2018, they added it to Merriam-Webster's and my name's in there. And I created this big conference around it as I wanted to take the data that we can now get for the first time ever, things about that hurry variability, neuroscience, and something called the exposome, which is the measure of all the things you're exposed to in your environment over the course of your life that changes your genetics. Mm -hmm. it, it, this is a data set we'll never actually collect all of it. It's like a real, a, a, a full-size map of California isn't very useful because it's as big as the state, right? Yeah, absolutely. But we're able to gather so much data that we can now validate things. Like in uh, the book before Superhuman, I wanted to test a Taoist equation. The, these guys are looking to live forever and they say flat out, if you're a guy and you wanna live forever, you should use this equation to control how frequently you ejaculate because it'll make you old if you ejaculate too much. And I looked at that and I said, that's complete BS. I have to test it and disprove this BS. And I ended up publishing a year's worth of data and I interviewed other experts in the field. And it turns out for guys, there really is an orgasm hangover, mm -hmm. right? And you say, what? I'm not saying have less sex. I'm just saying, decide how often you're gonna ejaculate. I would have said the data would not support that. And what I'm finding is the more I dig deep in, in shamanic knowledge yeah. and you say, how could that possibly work? And then I go and I, I look at the neuroscience of it, like, oh my God, these people couldn't, using our language and our tech, they couldn't explain it. Correct, for our time. But they learned by watching for generations and their elders handed it off and handed it off. And one of the coolest things I can think of in this space the lady who discovered the opiate receptor in the brain, massive transformative thing, uh, her name was Candace Pert. And I'm, I'm sad she passed away right before I could interview her. And in her book, she writes about how after maybe 20 years of her career of just being hardcore Western scientist, atheist, just you're rejecting anything that might be energetic, she started realizing maybe I have to pay attention to this because there's something else going on. And she met this group of shamans. And she tried to explain to them what the opiate receptors were. And then the guy says something and they all laugh. And then she asked the translator and the, <laughs> the translator said, oh, they're laughing because they said, ha ha, she thinks these molecules actually exist. <laughs> <laughs> like they're both That's right. Hilarious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. It's crazy. Tell me about, talking about that, tell me about the, so you did a $120,000 stealth cell makeover. Oh, the stem cell makeover. Yeah. That was with uh, Dr. Harry Adelson in, right. in Park City. To break down what that is and why you okay. did it so that people understand I, a bit more about it. And I write about the yeah. details of stem cells and what's happening now and what you can get for $5,000 versus, in this case, $120,000 is at the very high end of what's possible. It's the most intensive stem cell procedure that you can do right now. What I did is I laid down, they put you under a sedation, but not full anesthesia. And they pull bone marrow and people go, oh, it's so painful. I had it done when I was unsedated. It's not that big of a deal. It just feels really <laughs> odd. I even Facebooked it. Uh, of a Facebook Live video. Did you Facebook Live this? Oh, yeah, I, yeah I didn't. I couldn't do the uh, this procedure because I was unconscious. But right. the one before that, okay. that I did just to see what the components would be. Uh, and I've done stem cells, you know, a variety of times, different technologies that are that are out here. And they pull the bone marrow. They pull your own fat. Um, they can uh, get the stem cells out of it. And then they go through. And depending on which part of the body, starting at the toes, every joint 
they inject stem cells into the joints so the joints will stay young. I'm going to be around for hundreds of years. So I would like to be walking around under my own power. I've had three knee surgeries before I was 23. And so I want my knee to be highly functional forever. I don't want to be in a cane when I'm old. Mm -hmm. And then a Johns Hopkins neurosurgeon who's been on my show, uh, Marcella, she uh, she flies out for it and she threads a cannula inside the spine. So they drip my own stem cells inside my spine and they are attracted to areas that are inflamed and they turn off inflammation and turn on growth. Wow. So they inject every vertebra. They do the face, hair, uh, male reproductive organs. And I, I Facebook live that when they did it another time too. That was funny without showing anything you can't <laughs> unsee. Uh, and you wake up four hours later it's sort of going, what just happened? But the regrowth and the, the rejuvenation happens six, nine months later mm -hmm. as the, the tissues themselves turn over and you get younger. Mm -hmm. it's, that's at the very cutting edge. But if you, you just have a lot of knee pain or an injury that won't heal, I did all that stuff three years ago with stem cells. I had this thing in my right shoulder. It's gone. All these things throughout my body that you accumulate over time. You know, when we're young, we oh, I'll go mountain biking. Sure, you know, I'll play soccer. And even though yeah, there's a totally. piece of bone fragment sticking out my thigh, I, just one more rent. Absolutely, yeah. And you pay for it later, and then you can reverse it. And that's mm. what I did. That's incredible. And what what level of when you, when I'm hearing that someone who's not had any of those processes, and mm -hmm. I'm speaking on behalf of most of the audience, I guess yeah. have not done that. What level of risk are you comfortable with, or have you researched this to so much of a depth that actually, when you do this, you're like, I'm not experimenting at all because there's very little risk. Like, what level well, of risk do you feel comfortable with? I, I talk about return on investment as the primary lens I'm looking. I, I look mm -hmm. for for anything I do. There's how much energy do I put into doing something. And then there's how much time and then there's how much money do I put into mm -hmm. it? And then what's the return I'm looking for? Mm -hmm. And dying is the return I'm not looking for. Mm -hmm. The problem is that if you just do what you're doing now, your risk is probably 80% mm -hmm. that one of the four killers from superhuman are going to get you. It's cardiovascular disease, cancer, Alzheimer's disease, or type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. So you pretty much have an 80% chance of doing those. Yeah. <laughs> and that come, those all come with 20 plus years of suffering before you die. Uh, and you're not in charge of yourself when you die. Mm -hmm. So those are crappy odds. Absolutely. The worst odds ever. Mm -hmm. So how willing are you to take a few risks to avoid that? I'm willing to take a few risks, but they're not stupid risks. Okay. I'm in a room. I've got one of the top trained neurosurgeons out there doing a procedure. The risks are exceptionally low when you have that. I'm not doing anesthesia. I'm doing sedation. So the risks are low and the returns are more energy now, more energy for the decades, more time I'm going to live. And as I age, I will age differently than baseline human models. Mm -hmm. And that is very precious. And if there's a risk of one in 50,000 of something really bad happening, one in 50,000, maybe it's one in 10,000, I don't know. But I will tell you that if you're popping Advil right now, you're facing those same kind of risks. Like yeah. We're all facing risks all the time we don't know about because we totally. never hit. Totally. In fact, I got to go back to those that bowl of French fries. It causes more inflammation in your body than smoking a cigarette for a longer period of time. You probably ought to not do either one of those, but mm -hmm. most people listening to this, yeah, I'm talking to you, the French fries taste good. I'll eat them, right? Have you done the risk analysis on that behavior? No, because it's normal. And can we talk about cancer and alcohol? Let's do it. Yeah. Just go to PubMed, which is the database of all these studies, and look at the relationship between drinking alcohol and cancer. It is not good for you. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, oh, I'm so worried that I do the stem cell procedure that could make me feel really good and fix that, that, that joint or that hip or that back pain that they might want to fuse my spine for. I'm going to go spend $5,000 doing that. Oh, I could never do that. It's too risky. It's too expensive. You spent five grand on wine this year. Coffee. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. that's coffee's, I coffee's worth it. I mean, come on. Man. No, I know. <laughs> I, was, but, I said that as a joke. But, totally. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the, that whole thing, okay, you spent that same amount of money on something that we know contributes to cancer, right? And I'm not picking on wine specifically, just alcohol as it metabolizes increases your risk. Mm -hmm. By the way, I actually had sake last night. It's not like I never drink. I can tell you I took supplements that turn off the negative effects of it when I did that. But you you can still enjoy life. But people are not very good at doing risk math. Yeah. And when you look at those two things, you spent the same amount of money on things that are vaguely pleasurable and vaguely bad for you. Mm -hmm. Or you could have done something that was a step up in your performance. I know what I'm going to choose. 
I'm going to skip the French fries. I'm going to occasionally have really good wine that's expensive instead of a lot of cheap wine. And uh, I'm going to do the stem cells. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, and it, and it comes back down to what, what we both know Thich Nhat Hanh said about wanting familiar pain where, versus unfamiliar pain. Yeah. And we'd rather have familiar pain of everything that our ancestors have had or family members who have had. So we have some familiarity with it, whether that's mm -hmm. cancer or Alzheimer's. So we feel, oh yeah, it's kind of something we've all had. We feel, whereas the unfamiliar pain of, I don't know what that looks like is so much more scary. Mm -hmm. uh, even though, like you said very clearly and statistically, that actually our odds are not good anyway. And, and that's, that's, the, uh, that's the argument that, that hits me the most, is yeah. that in so many areas of my life, I'm convinced that the way we've always done it is, is rarely the right way. It, one of the things you learn if you, if you go to any ancient yeah. practice lineage, look, we're all going to die. Mm -hmm. And even when I talk to my immortalist friends, you know, those super long jobs, I'm going to upload myself to the internet, newsflash, the universe will collapse in on itself sometime. We're all going to die. You, you just have to get used to that. Yeah, and a lot of people, oh, I don't want to, sorry, that's just a fact of life. 100%. The question is, how much suffering do you want to do before you die? Mm -hmm. That's really what we're doing. And for me, I actually don't like suffering. It's amazing. But discomfort is different than suffering. So anytime you do something that makes your brain or your body evolve, it will involve discomfort. Mm -hmm. But suffering comes when you resist the discomfort. Mm -hmm. And understanding, all right, I'm feeling a lot of emotional discomfort right now, but it doesn't mean I'm suffering. It doesn't mean I'm struggling. It, it means I'm accepting and, all right, it's a signal. So I'm lifting this heavy thing. I'm really sore the next day that was the cost of growth mm -hmm. or I'm facing my fears and I'm doing it anyway. And I feel like I'm going to shit my pants and I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to see what happens. That's how our brain evolves. We're wired to do, th to, to focus on things that don't push us Yes, because that's biology. Yes. Well, if, once you decide you're going to take charge and you're going to push yourself, you say, all right, maybe I will live to 180. Maybe I'll live beyond 180. Uh, or maybe I'll just, you know, ask someone out who I'm really afraid to ask out. Why the hell are you afraid to ask someone out? The worst they'll do is say no. It's the same as saying, look, do you like pizza or Chinese? Okay. If they say, I like pizza, you're like, darn, I'd like Chinese. We're not compatible. It's not a judgment on you. But if you don't ask, you don't know. Yeah. But people, they have all this crazy programming in their heads. I got rid of most of my crazy programming just through these, these processes. And I don't think I could have had the, the power to do that if I hadn't have just gotten my base biology working with food. And so we get wrapped up in all these fears and resistance things. But really, the simplest, lowest hanging fruit here is just eat the stuff that makes your brain work, mm -hmm. and then you'll start being comfortable pushing yourself. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just too tired to push yourself. Absolutely. Let's talk about, I, I want to talk about the seven pillars that make us old. Okay. But before we do that, let's talk about, because you mentioned it now, some of the foods that are good for our brain that are basic that anyone can start doing today. And which right. ones to remove too, because we've already got the... The uh, fries out, okay. yeah. fries and alcohol. It, right. Anything deep fried, mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter if it's Brussels sprouts, I, sorry, especially at a restaurant. And I, I've got the Bulletproof Coffee Shop in LA. It's a restaurant. I know what happens back of the house. And I we don't have bad oils there, but the typical restaurant uses the same oil for a long period of time. Oxidized just plant oils are not good for us. Mm -hmm. Our cell membranes, and I go through really cool new, new science in, in uh, Superhuman, 45% of the cell membranes in your body are saturated fats. And the brain militantly holds that constant, but the amount of unsaturated fat can change dramatically between omega-3, which is more of a fish oil, and omega-6, which is the plant-based ones. So if you only eat plants, you don't get omega-3s, the kind that come from not plant-based omega-3s, those don't work, unfortunately. You end up changing about 15% of your, of your brain cells into these highly inflammatory things. So you tune the very composition of your being by choosing the kind of fat you eat. You eat french fries, your body will take damaged, unnatural fats that have never been a part of your system and it'll try to build batteries out of those. And you'll get batteries that make half charge. And then you walk around going, hmm, I, you know, I, I wonder what's going on. This is just kind of how I feel. Yeah, I got a little bit of a muffin top here. But what you really have is you have a muffin top in your brain. Mm. So the inflammation happens there. So a big part of what I do is I'm eating at least half my calories from fat and usually 70%. But I'm very careful. The fats I eat are undamaged. I eat a moderate amount of plant-based fats. I don't eat omega-6 fats much at all. You're still going to get a lot of them because they're out there. But I'm careful to get fish oil, which is really, really good for you. You can do it by eating fish. If you're going to eat fish, you want to take something that binds mercury in the fish. 
Um, and I make supplements that, that have specific kinds of oils that go into the brain. But the real, really good fats that come from plants, macadamia nuts, avocados, and coconut oil is one of those things where you say, all right, it's good for you. It is to a certain extent, every kind of fat, including coconut oil, it's a whole bunch of different types of fats mixed mm -hmm. together, different lengths of chains of fats. And people have heard MCT oils, because I'm the guy who put MCT oils on the map, right? It turns out that 52% of coconut oil is MCT oils. So then uh, an unscrupulous marketer will say, yeah, I'm selling MCT oils. Bad news, about 40% of the fat, and that's 90% of the MCT oil and coconut oil, it's legal to call it an MCT oil, but it doesn't have the special powers for turning on your brain and mitochondria. Mm. So now you say, wait, this is labeled MCT oil and this is labeled MCT oil, but they do very different things. So yeah, you can use some coconut oil as a fat source, as a fuel source, but you can't eat enough of it. In fact, it would take 20 pounds of coconut oil to equal one pound of the stuff that I make. Wow. And so it's Everclear versus weak beer, <laughs> as an analogy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's important to say eat some coconut oil, but a huge amount of saturated fat like from coconut oil, if your gut bacteria is broken, will bring toxins from your gut into your brain, into your body. So then, okay, what else do I eat? It turns out the template for this is called the Bulletproof Diet. It is a plate covered in vegetables. And it's really important. It's not covered in grains. It's not covered in legumes. It's not covered in potatoes. It's covered in vegetables, okay, green stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not covered in kale either. Mm -hmm. right? Kale has a whole bunch of anti-nutrients in it. And I read about thallium, a toxic metal that accumulates better in kale than any other plant we've ever found. So we're talking broccoli, cauliflower, uh, celery, fennel, carrots, stuff like that. And then you cover it in fat, guacamole grass-fed butter, uh, things like that, so nuts, olives, olive oil. And I want to say cover it. You don't have to go liberally. It's not <laughs> a little bit of sauce. No, you, you want to soak it in that yeah. fat. And then a moderate amount of grass-fed or wild-caught protein. Most people eat way too much protein from animals. And I'm talking two, maybe four ounces. And the anti-aging numbers, it turns out, you want to eat less meat than you think you want to eat. But if you go to zero meat, I know you're, you're plant-based, but um, what you end up finding is that people today, and most people listening to your show, they don't really, they say they care, but they don't really care about where the animal they eat came from. Mm -hmm. So we are supporting the death of the planet by eating industrially raised feedlot animals. I do not eat those. I never eat those. They will make you old. They'll make you fat and they'll make you sick. They'll destroy your gut bacteria. And along the way, they're destroying the very soil of our planet. So feedlot meat is off the map. And then people say, but I can't afford it. I'm like that's BS. If grass fed meat is twice as expensive, eat half as much, which is going to make you live longer anyway. So your budget will not change if you do this. But what will happen is you go to a restaurant and you say, is it grass fed? And they say, no. And you say, I'm, I'll order the vegetarian. Right. And then you can say, is it grass finished? And if it's grass fed and grass finished, you've done the planet a favor. The animal actually led a life that it was supposed to live, right? And you've contributed to soil and you eat a moderate amount of that and you feel really good. And one of the nutrients that's been missing that was a, a huge game changer for me was collagen. And the reason collagen is cool right now, Bulletproof put that on the map. Mm. And we're now the second largest collagen brand out there. The reason collagen is so important is that for me, I had this arthritis in my knees and I always had soreness. It went away when I started eating collagen. And on that same trip to Tibet where I discovered yak butter tea, I'd say I discovered it. The Tibetans knew about it for thousands of years, but I tried <laughs> it and discovered how I felt on it. Um, I had wrecked my knees. I had descended 7,500 feet um, from the Annapurna base camp area in one day. And I, my knees were bruised. The cartilage was bruised. I already had pre-existing injuries and screws in my knees and stuff. I couldn't walk. I, like, to go across the street to get a cup of coffee, it was like, you know, two, two canes. And I felt like I was 100 years old. I had seven days until I was going to be able to recover enough to walk 26 miles around Mount Kailash. And I just asked the guy on the bus with me, I said, all right, can you read this Chinese menu to me at this little Tibetan roadhouse, the only restaurant in town? 
And I'm looking for collagen because I knew from the anti-aging work I'd been doing, I needed some building blocks just to fix my knees. And you couldn't buy collagen powder back then. It plus in Tibet and they wouldn't have it. So I ordered the only thing on the menu that's going to work. It's a bowl of pig's ears. Now, I've never eaten that before. And I know what it looks like. And it arrives and it's chilled. And it's literally a big bowl of maybe 15 Ugh. cold pig's ears. And I'm just going, this is really unpleasant, but I'm in pain. So I, I go, what can I do here? I said, like, so I got the soup and I dip them in the soup to heat them up. And it was like, arr, arr, arr. What Man. Are crunchy? Or no, they were that? soft. They're okay. like steamed and just sitting there. Oh. But you know what? The next day I could walk. It was that big of a deal. I just, my body was trying to heal and I did not have the nutrients I needed to heal. And now I want to hear people who add collagen to their diet, whether it's in their coffee, whether it's on their things, mm -hmm. uh, on their food, it's a kind of a flavorless powder when it's done right, or it tastes like socks if it's done wrong. Um, what ends up happening is the pain I've had for 10 years on my ankle, my knee, my back, it just went away. And um, my, my hair is growing stupidly fast. I have to diet more often and, and things like that. I hear that from women all the time. They like it though, because they want a thicker hair. They got yeah. it, but now that they're going to the, the, you know, the salon more than they did. So those are important nutrients. And then you say, all right, there are people who are saying, I, I want to be plant-based and you know, you're one of those. Now, why, why are you plant-based? Is this an ethics thing or health thing? Both. All right. Got yeah. it. So Ethically, as a guy who runs a 32 acre organic farm with turkeys and pigs and sheep, where is the fer where's the fertility in the soil that makes your vegetables supposed to come from if we don't have animals? I mean, factory farms for grains and corn and things like that. What they're doing is they're taking these minerals from a mine. And it's, this actually isn't really even a mineral, nitrogen, it's just a nutrient they're putting in the soil. Well, if they had animals that would come in during winter and just crap on the soil the way they do on my farm, the soil would replenish itself and it would actually get thicker. Soil is the biggest carbon sink we have right now. It's getting thinner and thinner and thinner because we're basically overdriving the soil, but we're running out of the things we use to overdrive it. So when you go to a permaculture model, you don't eat very much meat, but you might say take advantage of ghee or butter. But we're talking about one or two cows on many acres that walk around and do their job. Mother Nature designed sheeps and cows and ruminants to just walk around, munch on stuff, and then poop. And it's and they poop everywhere. It's kind of horrifying as a farmer. <laughs> but I, I have pictures showing this part of the 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 uh, I'll call it a lawn, but the pasture where they live, it's vibrant and green without any water being added. And right next to it, the part where it was fenced off, it's gray, it's, it's light brown. The only difference is the poop. Mm -hmm. right? So you think about that, go, wow, what does this mean on a global scale? It means that if we go all plant-based, the very ecosystem that has supported farms forever has always been based on animals pooping on the farm. Mm -hmm. it, it ends mm -hmm. and then we won't have nutrient-based vegetables and you can actually pull off a vegetarian diet and be pretty darn Absolutely. healthy yeah, yeah. but the people are saying you know i'm never eating anything that came near an animal that they haven't thought through the system of it yeah. and uh having gotten actually quite sick on a raw vegan mm -hmm. diet even though i'm pretty well educated on how to do that mm -hmm. there are some vegetables that don't work for people right it's like no vegetables kale. that don't work raw too oh yeah exactly yeah. and cooking is an okay technology mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, the nightshade family, things mm -hmm. like bell peppers, for some people, they work just fine. And for other people, they will wreck you. Absolutely. Right. And I'm one yeah. of those. I don't, I don't eat nightshades because yeah, I tested it. Too. We don't I, I feel like crap. Either. Yeah. feel like crap too. Yeah. And so I would say eat mostly like a vegan and the fat you put on there doesn't have to be vegan fat. Yeah. But if it's industrially raised fat, shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> just, just put it out there. Yeah. No, that's great. Let's, do, let's talk about, I, I think that's brilliant. That's it. It's what I love about that is that I think, and this is this is partly education too. It's the way we make decisions are often not stretched out enough. We're not yeah. looking at the societal community, family. We, we look at things so small in mm -hmm. one sense of just like how it affects us and the four people around us, yeah. as opposed to how things are affecting them. And I feel like you're stretching our mind, which is wonderful. The, so. the idea is we should eat to feel really good all the time and we should eat to be here for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. How do we do that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the planet lasting, which was yeah. your point earlier yeah. of like everything else that we're doing with factory farms is killing the planet. So yeah. there won't be any soil to live. Hence we yeah. won't last 180. Yeah. Tell us about the seven uh, pillars that make us okay. 
some of you that you've kind of told us. This is interesting. You go back 20 years, I started running an anti-aging nonprofit group. We, we were doing research. We had people coming in, giving lectures in Palo Alto, but we didn't really know why we were aging. We had different ideas and they've now been so baked in based on really good research using unimaginable DNA visualization techniques, the ability to, to do things that are out of Star Trek in, in terms of, of seeing inside our body. And we now know there's seven things that are making us old. And this is really important because a lot of times say, what's the one thing I could do to live a long time? It's the same thing as what's the one thing I could do to make my car last a long time? Totally. Like, I'm pretty sure you got to rotate the tires and change the oil. Just, just saying, yeah, you know, yeah, there yeah. might be a few other things, fuel filters and all that. So the seven pillars of aging are the things that we now know are the causes of aging. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, okay, how do you avoid this? If aging is death by a thousand cuts, how do I take less cuts? Mm -hmm. How do I make the cuts less deep? And then how do I heal them like Wolverine instead of just slapping a Band-Aid on? And if you do that, that's the roadmap to living to 180 and feeling good along the way. So let's look at what the seven pillars yeah. of aging are. Okay. And one of the first ones is telomeres. And people have oftentimes heard about this. There's all kinds of tests you can order online that measure blood telomeres, which don't really reflect tissue levels that well. But what we do know is every time a cell divides, it basically takes one off a little string of counters. And eventually you reach what's called the hayflick limit. A cell can't divide any more times because its little counter got cut down. Well, all you got to do is find the enzyme telomerase that lets you lengthen that. And there you go. One of the seven pillars is handled. And in the book, I write about a couple things. There's a very expensive supplement. There's some lifestyle things. And there's a Russian peptide, a small string of amino acids you can just inject twice a year that probably has a bigger effect than anything else. I like that one. <laughs> it's cheaper and it's faster. Now, there's also something called zombie cells. And this is just, just becoming an early trend in anti-aging, although the researchers looking at these, what? The technical term is senescent cells. And these are cells that don't die, but they stop working. So they sort of sit there and they make free radicals and they don't do anything. And as you age, you get more and more of these over time. So if you can do something like, oh, fasting <laughs> or these drugs, one called rapamycin, that's really coming out for, from research. And there's a few other compounds being tested. There's a, another compound from seaweed or strawberries that I write about in the book that'll tell your body to kill the zombie cells, get rid of them. Mm -hmm. And guess what's going to grow to replace them? Young cells. Who would have thought? There's extracellular stiffening, which is outside of the cells. I call them cellular straitjackets in the book. Okay, what's causing that? Well, we've all heard of uh, beta amyloid plaque as the cause of Alzheimer's. It's a symptom, not a cause. But throughout your body, when there's inflammation, let's go back to eating industrial meat. Let's go back to eating the wrong vegetables. Let's go back to eating sugar and fried stuff. These things that cause systemic inflammation cause almost cellular level calluses or scarring. And as that builds up over the course of decades, you end up with cells that can't move the way they're supposed to. So you got to remove the stiffening. And there's a set of techniques to do that in the book. And then we look at what happens when stuff builds up inside the cells. Imagine that inside every cell, there's an incinerator and its job is to burn garbage. Well, what happens if you have an incinerator and you aren't allowed to pull any ashes out? So you need to burn super clean. And then one day you just decide to stick a bunch of glass and metal in there. It won't burn. So the incinerator shuts down. Well, this happens inside the cells all, all the time. And so what if you ate less of the things and did less of the things that clogged up your incinerators? And what if there's a way to get rid of the cells with broken incinerators? There are ways to do that. There's also extracellular garbage. So instead of inside the cell, there's junk outside the cell that builds up over time. And one of the things I, I just did is I just did a, a dialysis uh, last week where they pull my blood out, run it through a special filter that gets rid of extracellular garbage, and then put my blood back in after it's clean. This is different than kidney dialysis. It's similar technology, but the filtration is entirely different. It's an anti-aging technique that's just coming online. I did that up with uh, Dr. Matt Cook, who's been on my show a few times. And 
So I'm getting rid of this junk. That's a pretty extreme procedure. There's other things you can do, like change how what you eat is cooked. If you're eating burned industrially raised yeah. meat, like you're so doing it wrong. Even burned veggie. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the, these blackened Brussels sprouts, stop already. Mm. Uh, you want to cook stuff with water. You want to steam it. You grill it gently if you're going to grill it. And you'll find a difference in how you age, your cancer risk, how you feel, even how you look the next day. Mm. And so cooking matters as well as the quality of what you throw on the grill and the composition really matters. And the science, though, is that it's causing this thing to happen. There's uh, nuclear DNA mutations. Okay. And the big one, the one that's funny because I wrote a whole book, my, my New York Times bestseller sandwiched between Homo Deus and Sapiens, mm -hmm. that book, <laughs> uh, is on mitochondria. And that was the one I was missing. So mitochondrial DNA mutation. The power plants in your cells, these things that sense the environment around you, make energy, make hormones, change how your, your, very, how your brain thinks, mm. uh, these things mutate over time. And... After I wrote Superhuman, a new study came out that said, oh, when mitochondrial function declines, that they are the things that power the repair of your nuclear DNA. So you have cells that are the building, the building uh, map, the roadmap, the plans for all of the hardware in your body. Mm -hmm. That's your nuclear DNA. And then you have the power plants and the wiring for it all. That's your mitochondrial DNA. And these things need to come together. It turns out when your mitochondrial DNA gets mutated over time, it mutates easily. It's no longer able to read and build cells properly based on this blueprint. And it's no longer able to repair the blueprint. So this is a major cause of aging. And the book before Superhuman uh, called Headstrong, I wrote about how 48% of people under age 40 have early onset energy decline, this mitochondrial decline, quantifiably measured. And everyone over age 40 doesn't make energy as well as a young person unless they hack it. Wow. And so one of the big things that you do in superhuman when you're following the plan there is you say, how do I make energy like a young person? Yes. And when you do that, you get the response time in your brain of a young person and you get better skin and your cardiac function improves and you don't get Alzheimer's disease and you don't get diabetes and you don't get cancer. Mm -hmm. And all those risks are actually associated with mitochondria, but it's only one of the seven pillars. So you could say, I have the best mitochondrial <laughs> function ever and my cells are in straight jackets and I have lots of senescent cells. You're still not going to like what happens. That's why you manage your risk on all these. And everything in this book, all seven of, of those things, there's, here's what you do that's free. Here's what you do that's you know, 50 yeah, bucks, yeah, the right. supplement level thing. That's what I love. Here's what the crazy billionaires are doing. Mm -hmm. And I went out of my way to do all the crazy stuff, even if I didn't really need it, as much as I could so that I could write about it and, yeah. and talk to the experts while they were probably you know, <laughs> injecting me with whatever and get the knowledge, but also share the experience of it. And what makes me really happy is right now, people are fortunate enough to go see Dr. Harry and do the, the $120,000 whole body, six hand stem cell makeover. He's got one that doesn't do the brain stuff that's more affordable. And, you know, I can tell you, if you wait five or 10 years, I'm pretty sure that the costs are going to come down. Yeah, but absolutely. right now, for the cost to come down, it takes the very cutting edge people. And people get really pissed, like, this is just for old rich people. Look, here's the deal. Cell phones, when they first came out 30 years ago, when you were two years old, Okay, you probably don't remember this because you were two, but you'd see the Mercedes 300, the entire trunk was the cell phone transmitter. And this guy <laughs> had this big old brick on his head and he's driving down the freeway in LA talking on the phone yeah. and all the other people in the car, like, who does that asshole think he is? Oh my God, these stupid rich people on their cell phones. Okay, these are the same people, you know, playing Tetris on their phone or whatever. Yeah. But what happened is demand comes first. Everything is stupidly expensive because it's the cutting edge of innovation. The fastest computers. Like when I was eight years old, I had a computer that cost $5,000. It was a hand-me-down for my dad because he worked in the industry. It was before Windows was invented, before mm -hmm. DOS was invented. And no one had that when they were eight, but I just was like, I didn't even know what I had. This weird little green blinky thing, yeah. right? But now we all have that. And mm -hmm. these anti-aging technologies over the course of the next 10 years, 20 years, will come down a cost dramatically yeah. because they're being funded by people who are willing to basically spend everything they have mm -hmm. to get another couple years of quality of life. Absolutely. And all of us at a certain point in our life, no matter how much or how little we have, if you're facing death, you can say, you know what? I'm willing to make that bargain. And what I want is I want for everyone listening to the show to benefit from when a few wealthy people do that right now. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it is good for the world. It's good for everyone. And the costs will drop just like computer processors drop. Yeah. Right. 
Well, I am happy though, and I appreciate the fact that you do go into lifestyle changes here too. It's free. Like, like it's, it's yeah, exactly, free. that's what I mean. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important. Yeah. I, I, I like both mm -hmm. because I, th I think it is so important. Like what you're saying, it's when it's wisdom and science, it's lifestyle mm -hmm. and it's these stem cell changes, right? It's both levels because it's yeah. all levels of change. Because if we're not changing our mindset, we're not gonna change our behavior. And if we're not changing our biological behavior, we can't change our psychological effects. So I like to hope that someday we're gonna have such good and affordable technology that all of us can be, you know, I went on the cheesecake diet for a year and you know, I, I went on, I went on, on a huge series of inappropriate dates and I picked up all these weird diseases and I've got this huge tumor. I'm just gonna go into the doctor and for five bucks, I'm gonna hit reset and I'm gonna come out as a 17 year old <laughs> again. Okay, maybe this will happen. I kind of don't think so, yeah. but I would like to think that our technologies are good enough that you could be that stupid. Yeah. I also would you like- You think it'll make us a bit too reckless? There is data that shows that we adjust our risk. So when seatbelts came out, people yeah. started driving faster. Yes, exactly. That's what right? I mean. Yeah. But you know what? It's okay that there's risk in life. Who wants to live in a risk-free world? Risk, not reckless. Yeah. So what I think will happen, though, is when you realize, you know what? If I make a mistake like that, I can recover from it. I'm more likely to do something. But how good of a world is that? You mean I could possibly do something that's more fun, more exciting, more risky, or more, more worthy? Right. And if I come near dying, I know I'm going to be okay. That's profound versus right now, I'm too afraid because I might die. I, I want to create that world without fear. Yeah. But a world that still has risk. Yeah. Right? And, and I get that's that, necessary. Yeah. yeah and I, I vibe with that. The, the part where I always, and, and I guess this is always a small percentage of, pe percentage of people, but it's, it's the part that it's like, yeah, how much can you risk without hurting anyone else? Yeah, I think that's where pain to me is interesting because it's like, I'm, I'm like that. I'm like, yeah, I want to, you know, live to extremes and limits and test the barriers, mm -hmm. but never at the cost of hurting other people. And I yeah. wonder whether you, when you can reset, there's, there's that risk of like, oh, well, they can reset too, you know? And, yeah. and we all know that people, just as people age differently, oh, yeah. they also age emotionally differently. They also deal with trauma differently. They also yeah. deal with tragedy differently. So it's funny, people over 50 surprisingly uh, show more happiness. And I've studied happiness, mm -hmm. given big lectures on it and mm -hmm. wrote about it in Game Changers. Um, they actually show, they've actually had enough time to deal with their shit. Yeah. Right. And this is the horrible tragedy of, of being human. If you have children before you're 25, especially as a woman, your lifelong risk of every kind of cancer goes down, your health will improve, your odds of living longer go up. It's actually really good for you. The problem is that for 25 year olds to have kids, you haven't had enough time to build up a financial base and you also haven't had enough time to deal with your emotional shit. Mm -hmm. So now you're gonna have kids and you probably won't be a great parent because you haven't had a chance to do your own work, yep. right? You're still finishing separating from all the programming from your parents and all. So you're saying, all right, I'm gonna wait till I'm in my 30s and I have a financial base, but now having kids is harder on my body, right? It's harder on the family. So it's like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And it's one of the reasons that the, the birth rate is going down. People are saying, I'm gonna choose just not to do it. Or I'm gonna choose to wait a long time. Uh, and sometimes they wait too long. Mm -hmm. uh, but part of it is what you just talked about there. Mm, absolutely. Is there anything I haven't asked you today that you're like, David, you're like, Jay, I really want your audience to know this. So I really wanted to talk about this, whether it's, you know, yeah, it could be anything. I mean, there's so many other places we could go with this, but I just want to give you the. Yeah. One, one of the things we haven't talked about a lot is cognitive enhancement. Okay. This is something I've done for 20 plus years, mm -hmm. uh, nootropics. The reason modafinil is kind of cool. You look back 10 years, I went on Nightline. I was the only guy who would do it without a bag on my head. And yeah, I went to Warden. I was on modafinil the whole time. It was the only way I could even get my MBA and still yeah. work full time and all that. <laughs> uh, and it's one of many things like that. I just want to say it is well within our current technology to increase your IQ and increase your mental performance across all kinds of, of, uh, measures. Mm. There's natural plant-based compounds and animal-based compounds you can use that will help you. And I write about this stuff on my blog, daveasprey.com. Mm. There's pharmaceuticals that are proven to work. And every month or so, you'll see some big article saying, experts say these can't work. Like Experts who didn't read the goddamn research because I put it in my book. And there's five studies that show that you can type 15% faster on this stuff. Mm. Like if it doesn't work, how can this be possible, right? So we know that these things work. And I don't know what's motivated the people who will look you in the face and lie to you and say that they don't work because they do in some circumstances and they might work for you, but they might not. And you owe it to yourself to find out if you want to do that. And then there's technologies, breathing and meditation being the two cheapest and most accessible. And then there's the neurofeedback stuff that I'm doing at 40 years of Zen. And we didn't talk about my funky glasses. Yeah. The company's called True Dark. It's a company I founded. And I will tell you, I have doubled my deep sleep 
by using the glasses I made for sleep. I couldn't buy them anymore. That's about how that works. You have 5% of the cells in your eyes receive a light signal that you never see. It goes around your visual cortex into the timing system in your brain. And you can look at your body like a computer. There's quadrillion little tiny compute nodes. They're called mitochondria. And they need to work on the same clock. Because if the ones in your liver think it's daytime and the ones in your brain think it's nighttime, they don't match up. So this light comes in and it tells your brain what to do and it spreads the signal throughout the body. Well, the glasses that I make for sleep with TrueDark, it's a patented set of frequencies. These are all of them. It's not just blue blocking. That's not enough. It, blue blocking is too much during the day and not enough at night. These are the ones that keep you awake. So you wear these glasses. I can fly to New York. I got no, no jet lag at all. It eliminated jet lag for my life. And I get more sleep now in six hours, more quality sleep than the average 20-year-old gets in eight hours of sleep. And I published the actual numbers in here in yeah. Superhuman how to do it. So who would have thought the color of light is a variable that matters? Only by measuring, seeing what works, and understanding the fundamental wiring of our body can you create something like that. So for me, I'm wearing these glasses now. These are called the True Dark Daywalkers. And what these are doing is they're blocking some blue light, which means my brain works better all day because a lot of the interior lighting we have today creates brain stress. So by the five o'clock, you want sugar and you're tired. Yeah. I don't like that. I don't do that anymore. So Absolutely. I'm willing to walk around looking like a rock star. And tell us, <laughs> I love, and tell us what sugar does. Oh, man. I mean, you talked about fried and fried food, yeah. but sugar. And sugar is bad news. You eat it and it creates something called advanced glycation end products. Mm. Guess what clogs up those incinerators in the cells? It's advanced glycation end products. So you're basically browning the tissues in your body, you're increasing your risk of almost every disease, especially cancer and especially cardiovascular. And half of what's in sugar is fructose and half is another kind of sugar, uh, sucrose. Um, actually glucose, um, sucrose is glucose plus fructose. But anyway, fructose is what causes non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So if we were to look at everyone's liver in the room right now, there's a pretty good chance that there's some fatty liver going on. Mm -hmm. And if you're on an exclusively plant-based diet that doesn't have any saturated fat for animals, your risk actually goes up a little bit. But so you look at non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's caused by sugar. Mm -hmm. So if you don't eat sugar, it doesn't work. And what's interesting, you see this little uh, little weird puck Shape oh, yeah, on my yeah, arm yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I have a yeah, continuous glucose monitor on right now. Okay. So if I sleep yeah, yeah, I can that see, much. I can and we'll see if my shirt's loose enough. Yeah, it is. So now you're just showing off your muscles. Yeah, right. Yeah. So <laughs> the thing on oh, it's uh, Oh, it's got your face on it. Yeah, I did that. It was yeah. a joke. Uh, so it didn't have to have my face on it. But this <laughs> this comes on every 14 days. I, I put it on the other arm. And you can wave your phone or a little device over it, and it'll actually tell you what your blood sugar is. Oh, I love that. So and you created this? Uh, no, no, this no. is just something the, type 1 diabetic. Oh, it's just, for oh, it's okay. But it's now I want to know what sugar does to me. So I have yeah. this little device, and uh, I can wave it over this. And say it's at 5.2. That's uh, Canadian or European units. So this is it's around 100. Okay. And it's in the middle of the day. And the line's perfectly flat. So I can tell you, I didn't eat something that caused a blood sugar spike. Mm -hmm. The odds are that if after your next meal, if you had one of these on, we, we did it, you're going to see your blood sugar go up to 140, 150, if it's a typical vegan meal. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to say, I'm not a typical vegan, I'm eating a plate of green vegetables, and I'm not putting grains on it. Mm -hmm. I'm not putting a lot of legumes, maybe a little bit. And I'm putting a ton of olives and avocados and, and seeds and all that kind stuff. Kind of how we eat, yeah. Good, good deal. If you're yeah. doing that- My wife is the expert, not okay. me. <laughs> You'll see if it works, because if your yeah. blood sugar spikes, That's bad news, cool. man, it's That's not working. Cool. So I've been able to tune what is fasting doing and all that. That's so cool. It's data-based, and now I know what does low blood sugar feel like. I don't get it very often, but when I get it, I know, I know why. And I can also show you, if you get crappy sleep, you will have no ability to control your blood sugar. If you have emotional stress in your life, you eat the same food yeah, and your blood so sugar is all true, over. So it's true. crazy. Yeah, so, so that, that's the latest hack I'm working on. Absolutely. And I, and I love what you just said there because we know that when we're stressed, we turn to sugars, we turn to carbs, yeah. we turn to fats. Like that's what we do. What do you do when you're stressed? When I'm stressed, uh, mostly I meditate on the blood of my enemies. <laughs> 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 Sorry. <laughs> what do you What do you actually do? Um, I I'll usually it depends <laughs> like the type of stress. It's usually breathing or meditation. Okay, so that's what uh, you, yeah. There's no other. There's some inner energetic 
stuff mm-hmm. that I, I've picked it up then all sorts of interesting training in other countries. Um, there's usually some things I can do there. And it's, there's this amazing thing you can do. It's called you call a friend. And if that's work, call a therapist. Uh, it, it's it's pretty remarkable because then you can talk through someone who really understands the etiology of stress. And you can be that for your friends too. It's just hard to see it. I'm not going to see the big picture sometimes because I'm human, mm-hmm. unfortunately. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, but the, the problem is is that if you don't have someone like that in your life or your friends are afraid to really tell you, actually, you really are an asshole half the time, but I'm still friends with you. It's really hard to to have someone tell you that. It is hard. So a therapist's job is like, actually, you need to own this 100%. You're blaming the other person. You're just being a childish little jerk and you need to like put your pants on the right way this morning. And then you're going to have to do the introspection. So you got to have someone like that in your life. And so if I'm feeling super stressed and I can't figure out why, that, that really doesn't happen to me anymore. Yes. But if I'm feeling super stressed and I think I know why and I can't figure it out with friends, I'll call a therapist, I'll call a psychologist. And I don't have necessarily regular sessions, maybe once a month. And I'll just check in and then I'll say, you know, I'm having this hard time with this thing. And it's really like, it, it's causing stress, which is very unusual. I don't experience normal stress like normal people because I hacked all my stress responses. And then we figure out, all right, it's usually, and this is a key thing, it's a false belief so you are acting rationally and your feelings make sense if what you believe to be true is true. Mm-hmm. It's just bad assumptions. Mm-hmm. And those false assumptions lead us to terrorism. I used to think terrorists were crazy. No. If you believe what they believe, their behavior is rational. Is, is right? in line with The their beliefs belief. are wrong. And so if your beliefs are wrong, your emotions will be broken. Mm. And that's what a psychologist, a really good one or a therapist can help you see is that you assume something wrong, which is why you got in this, in this jam. So let's change your assumptions. And then you say, oh, and then the pain or the stress melts away because you changed the world you live in. Absolutely. I feel like I've been talking to the real life Iron Man. Have you ever <laughs> been told that? Don't tell anyone. Yeah. <laughs> have uh, you ever been told yeah, that? Yeah, people have, have said that. I mean, I've got my little yeah. bionic yeah, I'm wearing like the aura it. ring cool. and all that. Yeah, it's awesome. I, I just, I want to, I want to feel good all the time. I know, I love, yeah. I, I was blessed with feeling like I was old and literally I had the diseases of aging before I was 30. High risk of stroke and heart attack, pre-diabetes, arthritis, all that crap. I don't want to go back to that. Like mm. I know what it's like. Absolutely. I, I'm not going to get old the way, the way people expect because it just sucks too much. Absolutely. So Dave, we end every interview, the final five, which is a rapid fire question right. round. One word or one sentence answers max. Okay. You ready? Yeah. Okay, awesome. So question number one, what's a lesson you find hard to teach others? How to stop being vegan. <laughs> it's not hard. It's not hard. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I just had to say yeah. that. <laughs> tell, tell us something that genuinely is hard. Well, maybe if it is hard. For it, that actually is a really hard yeah, lesson. It's hard, yeah. Um, a lesson that it's hard to teach others is that there are layers of abilities and powers and energies that they have that they've never seen. Mm-hmm. It's just hard to believe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, second question. What's one thing you were once certain of that you recently changed your mind on? I was once certain that the less you could sleep, the better, because sleep is such a big waste of time. Oh, yeah. God, I used to have that one too. <laughs> I, I sleep my eight and a half hours a night. Now. Yeah, like, sleep yeah. quality, man. I, I've yeah. become a, a sleep advocate over the past few years as I looked at the data. Yeah. I still sleep as little as I can, but my sleep is really good. Yeah, So yeah. That, that was a big change. That's a great yeah. point, yeah. Okay, question number three. What's something about you that most people don't know that would surprise them? I was once, I was once bitten by a vampire bat. Where? In in Colorado. <laughs> they don't even live there, but I woke up when I was a kid okay. with a vampire bat feeding on my neck. You being serious? I'm very Oh, totally you're serious. being serious. Absolutely. Okay, I didn't believe you. Yeah. No, it's a real species. They hypothesized they came in on bananas. This was pre-internet, but we actually caught the bat and took them to the hospital. Oh, wow. It was just like that big, oh, not wow. very big. Okay. But yeah, it, it was kind of scary. Woke up in the middle of the night. It was, it was feeding and I didn't know what it was. And oh, oh my God. And I, I grabbed it and I, I thought it was a mouse and yeah. it wasn't. And I'm like, it bit me and I threw it down and it never hits the floor. It, it was yeah, really yeah. creepy. But yeah, that actually happened. So. Yeah, wow. Yeah. I, I, mine, I had a bat experience, but it came and literally like, it was, I was in India in Pune yeah. and it completely landed on my face. I was nine oh years God. old and I literally just pushed it off. Lucky it didn't bite me or anything, but wow. it literally flew and landed on my face. It was, it was it's my creepy. Batman moment. They carry a lot of diseases too, not just rabies. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. Question number four. What's something you once valued that you no longer pay attention to? When I was young, I really valued actually two things. Um, one was uh, being rich. And I made $6 million when I was 26 and I lost it when I was 28. 
And I could tell when I was 26, I said, I'll be happy when I have $10 million instead of $6 million, which is a super dick thing to say. Uh, so that, that fascination with when I have more money, I'll be happy. I, I have lost that. And you can say it's because you have enough. That's true. You need about 74,000 a year, but I can say that that obsession with it, no, it, above a certain level, it's just about what would you do with the money to make the world a better place? Cause you can't spend it. It'd be stupid. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one. Um, the other one is it has to do with uh, like wanting to be famous and recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was 23, I was in an in entrepreneur magazine because I sold the first thing that was ever sold over the internet. And it was a caffeine t-shirt said caffeine, my drug of choice. The first e-commerce before the word e-commerce was out there. No one knew what a big deal it was historically. Uh, for me, it was just being scrappy and trying to pay my college tuition. But, um, I was like, look at me, I'm in a magazine. There's a big picture of me in it in my double XL t-shirt and you know, puffy red face. And I just realized after 15 minutes of that, it didn't do anything. Like, like, like all of the, oh yeah, I'm gonna be recognized. It, it, there's no value in that. Mm. And, and that I'm gonna be enormously wealthy. There's some value in that, but not very much. So for me, it, it's like the, the rich and famous thing. It, it's about your mission and, and those things, whatever. Like, well, thank you for thinking it through. I love that answer. Okay, question sorry, number that, five. Sorry, that wasn't you, one sentence. It was, it was a great answer. I was happy you went off on it. This is the first time we're ever asking this question as a final five, so you get to answer this. I, I'm excited to ask you this question. If you could create any law for the world to follow, what would it be? I like be kind would, would be a really good one, but the really amazing law would be the law that limited the number of words in the entire set of laws in the country. Thank you so much for watching that video. If you enjoyed it, here's another one I think you'll love. These foods are designed to be addictive. Uh, there was an old statement that any white substance is addictive. White flour is addictive. White sugar is addictive.